Welcome to Gutter Room. This is Will Sanchez. My special guest today is Alan Rubin. He runs for Central Park Track Club. Alan has many interesting records. He's probably the only one that has completed the New York City Marathon under three hours in 25 consecutive times. Remarkably, he's also done the New York City Marathon in under 240 in 15 consecutive times. I'm thrilled to have Alan as a guest. Thank you. Alan, before we get started on these remarkable records, and also you had a very interesting year, let's introduce you to our audience in terms of where were you born and tell us a little bit about your childhood. Yes, I was born in London, fairly ordinary childhood, fairly close to the centre. We went to a school which was only, you know, 10 minutes walk from Regent's Park. Used to play a lot of uh, football, we called it there, but soccer for American audiences. So I used to play a lot of pickup soccer at lunch times. We'd always uh, head out to Regent's Park and kick the ball around. So I guess that was the first time I was running a lot. In terms of organized sports at our school, they didn't do soccer. We uh, were more traditional uh, school, so uh, rugby was the uh, okay. the thing of choice. And uh, you know, every one afternoon a week, we'd have our sports uh, day, and we'd usually play rugby. Okay. However, if it was too wet to play rugby, they'd send us out on this maybe two-mile cross-country course, and. Uh, yeah, I guess that's the only running I did in those days. Okay, well, did you particularly enjoy it, or was there any signs that this one might be a uh, something that was going to take uh, prominence in your life? Yes, yeah, sometimes also, yeah, our school would actually pick people to run against other schools, and I'd be picked. So there'd be no actual training, but you'd just turn up and run a cross-country course. So I was picked for this and also once a year there'd be uh, a cross-country race for the whole for the whole year and uh, I guess when I was 15 I came second in that race so by the time I was 16 I wanted to win that race and I won the race age 16. Did you train for that particular time when you were 16? No. No, but no one else did, so okay. it, was, uh, it was a level playing field. Okay. So you won, and uh, what, did they give you a prize? Uh, I got a certificate. I, I still have that certificate, actually. Okay. It was a meaningful win. Yes. Okay, so what happened after that? Did you go on to college? Yes, I went to uh, Manchester University and uh, did no sports there whatsoever. What did you college major things. in? Uh, majored in math. Really? What was about math that you like? Uh, mainly that I was good at it and found it, you know, uh, relatively easy to to work at. So, you know, so I'd have time to do other things at college. Okay, other things like drinking, oh, socializing, okay. <laughs> not running though. <laughs> but no running, just uh, no. enjoying uh, life to uh, as a college kid. Yes. Now you needed to decide a career for yourself. What was the next step? I didn't really know, I guess. So uh, I, I joined a company, uh, a computing company, and you didn't, at that time, this was 1978, uh, you didn't need a computing background. Started out with a six week training course. You in know, COBOL? With, or do you remember? Yes, in COBOL and with cards. So. Yeah, I mean, I'm still very friendly with, there was uh, 14 of us that started the course at that time and, uh, you know, we still have uh, reunions each year. Uh, I guess we recently celebrated the 35th one, Excellent. I believe. Okay, but uh, it sounds like you were still carousing back then and you were doing those computer stuff. So when did uh, physical fitness become more of important to you? One or two people I knew uh, were running the London Marathon at that time in the early 80s and uh, I thought, yeah, I, I'm sure I could do that. Uh, you know, it's just a question of how fast I could do it or, you know, one, if I trained for it 
I thought I could do it. So I, I think probably around 82, 83, I would run for a few weeks and then I'd get rejected from the London Marathon because even then it was hard to get into and, and I'd stop until the next year and try again and eventually I decided well if I don't get into London I'll run Paris. Did you get into London? And I, I didn't get into London no, that I year so surprise. I ran Paris that year which was uh, 1985. Yes. Okay and how did you do in Paris? I was hoping to break three hours at Paris and I was <laughs> probably on pace for halfway and then it was the the typical crash and burn and I you know and towards the end I'm thinking okay I just have to run this marathon then I never finish this marathon then I never have to do anything as hard or as silly as this again and okay. I uh, finished in 309. And, oh my uh, gosh that's still an excellent time. Yes. Within about a month or so, I, uh, I moved to New York with the company I was working with. They had a small subsidiary in New York. And uh, I think literally the next time I ran after that marathon was maybe two, three months after in one of the corporate challenge, Anyone? three and a half mile runs. Uh -huh. and Eventually, I started you, running. You, you wound up at the Central Park Track Club. In fact, you became president at one point. So how did they find you or you find the oranges, as they're called. October 1990, I ran the tune-up race, 30K tune-up race. And mm -hmm. I was talking to some people actually from the New York Harriers after the race and, you know, and they, were, and they were, you know, encouraging me to come to their workouts. And, and I probably would have done that. But, you know, on the way back, running through the park, I ran into someone I used to work with, uh, Phil Toop, who was a member of Central Park Track Club. And he said, oh, yeah, you've got to run for Central Park Track Club. And uh, the rest is history. As they say. And here, you've been there now for how many years now? Uh, 25 years, yes. Uh, amazing. Yes. Now, what is it about the Central Park Track Club that keeps you there? Obviously, lots, I've met lots of people through Central Park Track Club. Uh, I guess I, I met, even met my wife, uh, even though she was, was never a member of Central Park Track Club, she trained with us for a while in, uh, in uh, 1994. Mm -hmm. And the training is, is excellent, you know, it's just, just being able to train with another group of people, you know, at your level, you know, twice a week, you know, week in, week out, you know, you're going you're to improve. You said you met your wife. Your, your wife is, is well known also in the local area, Gordon Bakulis. So was it that caught your attention? I knew her name because she would win all the women's races and in a lot of the races we'd have similar times so and I'd always, you know, it'd be one of my goals in races would be to, you know, to at least finish ahead of all the women in the race. Of course that was a, a bit more difficult when Gordon was in the race, but I think I managed to keep ahead. Yeah, it was only really, like I say, when she started running with us, uh, the Central Park Track Club, that we got to know each other. And again, the rest is history. The rest is history. You're very cautious there. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> obviously she's quite an interest in you. I guess I'm going to have to have Gordon in that chair and get the real story here. Okay. And you're going to keep your car as close to your chest here. Now, as I mentioned it at the beginning, you have, you did some remarkable streaks. You did the 25 sub threes in New York City. It's, it's the 15 sub 240s part of the 25? Yes. So, so when did that start, that streak? The first two marathons I ran in New York were just fractionally over three hours. Okay. Uh, and then from 1989 through 2014 is the uh, Last 25 streak three. of sub That's when it 230. Ended. And within that, uh, yeah, you see, this is a good test. I think uh, 1991 to 2005, I, I did the 15 uh, sub 240 40. marathons. Amazing. So why did you go back to running the New York City Marathon? Because you did your farewell marathon, you're back in New York. <laughs> I guess at this point you were serious with Gordon. Was, did that have an effect in your running? 
It's by the time I met Gordon, yeah, you no, know, running was a, a, a big part of uh, of my life. You know, I'd already been uh, with Central Park Track Club for several years, yeah. and I was by then, uh, yeah, you know, I, I had my goal set on uh, running a sub two thirty marathon. Nineteen ninety eight, I ran a couple of marathons, and uh, the second one I broke. Uh, broke three hours for the first time around 259 but in 1989 I had my biggest uh, improvement in a, in a year this is back in London now I ran the London Marathon that year and I ran 247 then I ran Berlin in uh, September and I ran 239 that's the same year the same year oh, and then I also five weeks later I ran New York also in 89 I ran uh, 236 so uh, <laughs> so I thought okay next time I run I'll run uh, 229 but uh, <laughs> that was your goal it, to break 230 it took yes it took uh, a lot longer than uh, just the, the next one the next one but eventually you did I think you did it in Boston right 1998 in Boston so that's like in effect that's eight years after I ran uh, the 236 so okay. I it's interesting that uh, when you did that, you were really at your near peak. You didn't have that much more to give, although you felt you could do it because you only, you only broke that 231. There's actually quite a big difference between 236 and 229. And oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I had PRs along the way, and you know they, they were all significant. 232 was my best New York, actually. I ran that in 1993. Yeah, and then I ran 2.30 you know, three times before I eventually managed to run 2.29 in Boston. Yeah, we'd already had our first son. He would have been about nine months old nine at that months time. Old. Excellent. And I was so you, 41. you tie some of your milestones with your life's events, you know, your, your marriage, your, your birth of your first son. Yes. And so forth. Internationally, which one was your best? Was it Berlin? Was it... Overseas, uh, I think uh, the Paris I ran in 2005 was, it was certainly my best race in terms of, you know, what I was capable of, how I felt that day, and just how the whole marathon went. And I, yeah, I, and it's also, I guess, overseas, it's my fastest marathon. I, I ran uh, 234 that day, and you know, I, I finished a lot faster than, uh, you know, even from 20 miles to 26 miles, I, you know, picked it up maybe 10 seconds a mile. And wow. the race felt great. And so you probably did a neck of a split that day? Sure, yes, yes, yes. Have any of your New Yorks been neck of a split? Yes, a few have. And in fact, you know, that's one of the things that I'm fairly good at is able to pace the race properly and if not negative split which I have done a few quite a few times I uh, I'm usually pretty close you know my good my good races which most of them have been pretty good until recently uh, well, we'll talk about that <laughs> I've uh, you know have been you know within a minute first half second half I saw you so one of your races it was the celebration of a New York tradition the Lamisil Tusum that was also 1998. Started that race fairly easily. I know. I saw you fairly were, comfortably. Yeah, what's interesting? About, I don't know why they they filmed that particular. Was it a 10k? They had yes, announcers. Yes, it was a 10k. Yes, yes. And they were predicting, you know, these other guys were going to win because they looked strong, but. But they also noticed you were never that far behind. Nearly a quarter mile back, out of sight of the leaders, Alan Rubin was motoring along. With the patience and consistency of a marathoner, he began to gain ground on the front runners. With two miles to go, he passed Petraka, smiled, and kept up his rapid turnover. Rubin recently finished the Boston Marathon in 229. Within another half mile, Rubin had tracked down a now struggling Palacios. With workmanlike efficiency, Alan Rubin, a computer programmer who trains with the Central Park Track Club, chugged into the lead. That was a big race in previous years, and they'd had sponsorship money. And I think the previous year, you know, Kenyon had won it in, you know, 28 minutes. So I, I don't know if they knew it wasn't going to be that this year or what, but there was cameras there, so that was fun. No elite field, so, you know, I actually won it 
quite easily. I hardly ever win any races in Central Park or, or anywhere. Yes, and my wife won the women's race, which was less unexpected. There was little doubt about who would win the couple's race. Alan Rubin's wife held more than a minute lead for the women. Gordon Bakulis would not be caught from behind. You wanted to give you a car? What was the prize? A plaque. A plaque. <laughs> I'm sure it's a very uh, I think I still have it, yes. Oh, It's wow. one of the ones that I've managed to hang on to doing this remarkable record. In fact, I guess if you didn't run to sub three, that would be a disappointment for you because you were doing 240s and, and, and better. So during that time, what did you learn about your diet, yourself? How did you take care of yourself? Yeah, I would try to uh, eat pretty healthily. You know, not, not eat uh, sweet stuff, you know, eat lots of vegetables, lots of fruit. Uh, not so much red meat, nothing extreme, but, but I would pay attention. Okay. And, yeah. and you kind of, what kind of workouts did you do? And you said you, the, uh, the Central Park Track Club had terrific coaches. I think one of them is Tony Ruiz. Tony Ruiz, Was yes. he one he's, of your coaches? Yes, yes. He's been my coach since 1997. And I'd like to give a shout out to my coach before that, which was uh, George Wisniewski, who... Also of Central Park Track Club? Yes. So Tony coaches very much in George's style, and one of the main reasons, you know, I've been able to be, you know, very consistent with my marathons over the years, uh, is that I, I've been very consistent with my training as well. It hasn't changed much over the years, but it's been very, you know, I run at a level that it's consistent and that I don't get injured, so I'm able to repeat things year after year. How did you prevent injuries? I mean, everybody gets injured too. Is there, uh, besides having we should have an the right parents, what was your, your secret? Yeah, I think part of it is, you know, how I'm built, I guess. Uh, but also, uh, yeah, being smart is part of it as well. You know, if I felt something not quite right, I, would, I wouldn't worry about missing a day's training. You know, it's much more important to make sure I was, you know, nothing was niggling, nothing was hurting. and. Uh, yeah, I would err on the side of caution. I, I mean, I, I never really ran as many miles as I could have run. You know, I maybe got into the 80s typically before a marathon, but rarely much higher than that. I would have gone higher if I could have, you know, if I could have done it and felt I was running at the level I wanted to run and was clear of injuries. Well, but you were running sub threes and sub 240, <laughs> so obviously your mileage was just right. Yes, but whatever you're at, you always, you always want to improve. You want to improve. Like you want to go to the 220s, so yes. <laughs> I guess, when you, do, when you hit the 230. This was all until, you know, I was 49, then I started getting uh, injured oh, a little oh, more. Oh, okay. Now something happened this year, it sounds like it was totally unexpected. So tell us that story. I was getting in pretty good shape and I'd run 259 last year at uh, New York and I was you in number that 25 kind of... 25 consecutive yes. sub three. And I, and I was in that kind of shape, uh, maybe even better. And I was uh, getting ready for the New York City half marathon. In fact, I just picked up my number and like two hours later I, you know, I have a a weird uh, sort of numbness on the side of my face, and which I don't f think much of at the time. Uh, the, but then that night when I go, get up to go to the bathroom, I'm, I'm very unsteady on my feet. And, you know, so I, you know, I take the day off work, it's a Friday, and, you know, I'm still having difficulty walking around and it seems a little weird and I'm not really sure what it is. I, I am able to get around, but it's, you know, I have to be pretty careful, hold on to the banisters, going downstairs and I, I get, at some point I start getting some numbness on the right side of me and uh, anyway, eventually, uh, you know, I see the doctor Monday on the Monday and uh, I do some tests, a brain MRI, and uh, a couple of weeks later, you know, he tells me, you know, I had a stroke. So, you know, I haven't run till then and haven't really been able to, but I, uh, 
you know, I say, well, you know, I used to, by now I'm walking pretty much normally again. And so I say, okay, I'll walk every morning instead of running. And I go out to walk by the river and I think, well, let's see what happens when I try to run. And yeah, I'm unsteady, but I'm able to run a mile. And kind of from that day, I was running a mile each day, slowly building up again. I increased my mileage uh, over the months and I'd go back to workouts as well, Central Park Tracks, but I'd be running with a slower group. But meanwhile, you know, I still have the numbness on the right side. In fact, I still have it now. And the neurologist says it might very well not go away. Uh, Does that mean you can't feel yes, when so your I foot hits the ground? Yes, I can feel it hitting the ground, but the numbness is most pronounced in the foot, so I'm not feeling everything as I should in the foot. So actually that causes me to pick up uh, a plantar fasciitis injury and, you know, the pain becomes, you know, bad enough and the injury becomes bad enough that I can feel the pain through the numbness, which feels it's a different kind of pain, so I wasn't, it took me a while to figure out what it was and everything. and. Uh, so by then I realize I have to stop running, yes, and let the heel heal. Let's go back. I mean, it sounds okay. very positive that, that you didn't let the stroke diminish you in any way. You said, okay, I'm going to run again. I'm surprised it took so long. You said a week, week and a half before they gave you the diagnosis. You had a small stroke. Was there any other indications besides the numbness? Was there the blood samples test come back with any kind of deficiencies? They did a lot of tests on my heart, which they basically didn't find anything. But the hematologist did find a deficiency in the blood of uh, protein C and protein S, which I've learned now are, are naturally occurring decoagulates in the blood. So they, they generally stop the blood from clotting you know, when it shouldn't. That was pre-existing and is in fact a genetic condition. So she put me on uh, two baby aspirin a day, which is pretty conservative actually, So that, which is good, I'm, I was pleased about that. And, and I did another test where they can, apparently they can test the blood and make sure that there's no signs of it uh, pre-clotting, like everything looks good and it's not going to clot. Prognosis is good in terms of uh, you can run carefully, oh, now have a new awareness of your body in terms of the numbness, you're overcoming that. Yes. Now to CNS, not to alarm our audience because every, not everybody should go run out and have their CNS tested. You said it was a, a genetic thing? Yes. But you didn't know you had this deficiency. No, it was after the, the fact. I never heard of, of CNS. Me, me I don't neither. think anybody else. <laughs> you needed to do. Now, does that mean your children might have this uh, predisposition? That, that is actually correct. And uh, at some point, we, sh we need to get them tested for this as well. And your being in such terrific shape probably saved your life. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how much that uh, played into it. This particular stroke, it, you know, had its own name because it, it affected the brain stem. It's called Wallenberg syndrome. And, you know, when you look at, you know, other cases of people that had that brain stem stroke, they're, they're, it's a lot more serious symptoms. You know, they're unable to swallow. They have to be on an IV for, you know, for, for, for a time. Uh, and, you know, recovery is a lot, lot slower. Yours is the mildest form of it. Yes. I, I would have to suspect. Anyway, we would like to think that being in good shape yes. never hurts. And, and you said you did come back and run New York again this year. How did that go for you? Yes. It was actually nice. It was, you know, to see the marathon from a, a different viewpoint, you know, a much more crowded area of the field and uh, spending longer time on uh, First Avenue and uh, not being, you know, running at my maximum. And other people did catch up to me and I'd try to run with them for a, a while and then, you know, I couldn't because of cramping or, you know, my back okay. was a problem. But uh, yeah, no, I had, a, 
it, it was a very nice time. Two particular people I met on the course, uh, James Siegel and uh, Terence Gertzberg. Yeah. Coach um, T, yes, yes. Oh, he was probably wearing his bombus. You know, I think he was running from yes, yes, back and, of my feet. Yes, yeah, and, uh, you know, and he was psyched. He was like, hey, I get to run with Alan Rubin. Fantastic. I did enjoy that. Uh, excellent, excellent. So I think I'll be able to get back into my regular kind of training and, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, get back within five or ten minutes of, uh, of my uh, marathon time. Oh, you still want to do, I guess event. now, the three twenties or three tens. Yes, yes. But, you know, again, it's all, always, you know, when I've been running, it's like, okay, how fast can I run? you know, given where I am now. And so, you know, it, it's the same thing. You know, I still want to run as fast as I can, okay. you know, in my current condition. But what you're saying I'm is optimistic. really listen to your body, you know, and yes. uh, because, it's, because it'll never lie to you. That's right. All right. Do you want to give a shout out to the people that made a difference in, in your recovery? Yes, I would obviously like to thank my wife, uh, Gordon Bakoulis, who also, you know, had a difficult year this year because, you know, uh, my mother-in-law, her mother, passed away. Oh, so sorry. And my coach, uh, Tony Ruiz, gets a terrific shout out, and uh, all the people at uh, Central Park Track Club, and but mostly uh, my three sons. Uh, Joseph Rubin, Joey Rubin, who's now at uh, Rutgers University, uh, Samuel Rubin, who's uh, looking for college at the moment and is uh, doing very well with his uh, travel soccer, and my youngest, who is looking to move into middle school, uh, Daniel Rubin. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Will. It's a pleasure. Thank you.